everybody, and welcome to After Chat. This is our eighth episode. Yep. We're almost, we're almost double digits. Almost double digits. Uh, as always, I am your host, Tom Model, After Pixels Photography. And I would do Ryan G, Chief Point Photography. All right. And we, uh, I've had some good weather here in Pawtucket recently, so I nice. titled the episode, Get Out There. Because that's what I've been trying to do lately, is that's get out nice. there. It's been very nice out here this past week. Uh, so, some kind of fun things going on in uh, in camera world. Uh, there's a uh, Kickstarter for this new thing called the Center Camera. Uh, I'm actually excited about this, not because I would ever buy it, but because it's just kind of a cool idea. Um, what these guys have done is they've taken a self-sufficient device that can take 360 degree panoramas. It's four um, ultra wide angle lenses around a circle. So it's like north, south, east, west on the circle. And they actually, I don't have the picture in here, but the, the description, the way they describe it is the four angles overlap by enough that you don't lose anything in the panorama. And then the really cool thing that makes this work really well is that it has a hole in the center. So you actually put it on your thumb, hold your thumb up, and then it takes the panorama. So there's nothing in it. You can actually just hold oh, it over it's your a head. Still, it's a still? It's a still. All right. It doesn't still. Um, What's the resolution of it? It's, it's, that's it's ridiculous. It's actually pretty large. That's always my worry with a sensor that small. That's kind of. Uh, I think each one is like a seven megapixel sensor. Yeah. So when you stitch them together, that's still. Yeah, but it's still, you can't really go very far with a seven megapixel shot of a quarter of a 360. That, I'm sure it'd be interesting. Maybe, it, it, maybe in the, the future it'd be better. The demo pictures are, are pretty decent, but the real key thing here is there's no stitching. It's all done inside the device. That's, I could see you doing that. That's where that that's where their big difference is, is that you don't have to stitch it. You don't have to do anything at all when you plug the USB cord into it to download it or take the, I think it's a micro SD card out of it because it's pretty small. Uh, when you take it out and take the data off of it, it's done. Yeah, I've been having problems with stitching in Photoshop. I don't know if Photoshop does not like me now. Photoshop used to work very well for stitching, and I haven't I, gotten it to work properly in CS6. I've had some issues, not so much with stitching, but with trying to overlap pictures that are mostly the same, and I'm trying to, almost like HDR, but not really. Like, I'm trying to ghost two images together, and it's basically coming back going, oh, these two pictures have nothing in common. I'm going, they're the same fucking picture. Yeah, <laughs> Photoshop, CS6 has been strange for my Nikon. Yeah. So, but I've, I, in the past, I've had good luck with stitching photos together. It just takes forever. But then again, it's usually like I've taken like 30 pictures and I want to stitch them together. So it's like, go, oh, I'm going to go to bed and come back tomorrow. And Mine just them. fails. It's been failing. It's, it's weird. Hmm. I am not reading this. Feel free. Oh, no, no. I'm just going to link to this. I just, I, I put it in here. So there's, there's some fun things. It's, it's funny. It's funny. So. So there's a photographer, in, well, I don't know if he's really a photographer, well, he's in New York. I haven't actually looked up his website yet. The guy puts up a, on, a, on Craigslist his ad for his used Tokina 11 to 16 millimeter f2.8 lens. Uh, the Craigslist ad is absolutely hysterical. We'll definitely link to it. I got to linking to things last week. I actually linked to things. Linking things. Uh, so I'll, I'll link to it, and if it's down, I will link to the Aperture Chat blog where I'll post up text from it. Uh, highlights of this is he refers to the lens as a dope ass pimped out Tokina 11 to 16 millimeter f2.8 lens. Yeah, you saw that right, 11 to 16 millimeters. Uh, yes, this is, uh, let's see. He refers to turning your boring ass D7000 into a stone faced lady killer. Yeah, and uh, I think my favorite quote out of here is, um, oh, is it on the, it's on the second page. Um, where's, where, where's the Usain Bolt quote? There it is. So it's like, 2.8? Fuck yeah, 2 goddamn 8. You hear that? That's Usain Bolt crying because this lens is repping Japan in the next Olympics and he knows he's going to lose. Yeah, it's, it's just funny. It's terrible. It, it's, it's one of those best of Craigslist types of ads that's just absolutely hysterical when you're reading it. You're going... Does this guy take himself seriously? But uh, apparently he does. Oh, I like the spaghetti thing. That's the SpaghettiOs? Funny. Okay, if nothing else, read through it for the SpaghettiOs joke. 
and I will definitely just move it to the Aperture Chat blog because that way I, yeah. I can link right to it. But yeah, the, the SpaghettiOs thing is perfect because he starts talking about it like halfway through and then he starts coming back to it over and over again until the end. <laughs> I actually might have bought it just to bring the can of SpaghettiOs in a briefcase. <laughs> that is pretty funny. <laughs> The next story you, you told me about quick when I walked in. Um, oh, it's an Australian newspaper. Chris Winter is using an Anker battery pack with a bunch of doodads to make 9 volt DC work with his Canon T3Is, T4Is. Uh, T4Is. He's got a 3i and a 4i. So, yeah. Both. Some of the best battery packs, if you ever use them, they're battery packs that charge external USB devices, phones, all that kind of stuff. Anker is a really reputable company for that. They make very good big beefy battery packs and apparently this person's been using them to get nine hours of video out of a t3i yeah so if you they output dc so if you hook up the dc to the big anchor battery pack it'll last a lot longer than the little tiny camera batteries yeah um i watched the video he's going from the anchor battery to a dc coupler wire to yeah. the ac adapter input piece that like i have in, in yeah, the, the 2i the ac adapters for the rebels have the dc plug right yeah that's that's what that's yeah, so he's using just a little coupler piece to go from the DC output on the... I think it comes with it. It's built to do this. Well, mine, mine didn't. Maybe the Aussie version does. But See, mine... the, he, like you're, this is written like he figured something out. The, uh, the anchor literally goes, has a DC out into these things and like shows a laptop, a DSLR, and something else. It's like they, they market for this. This isn't really like a thing. Yeah. But, but, but he's, he's doing it, it, and he's put the battery on the cold shoe to put it on top so he doesn't have to carry the battery around. It's kind of heavy for a hot shoe. It is. Al, you got to see his next video after that then, because it's even worse um, as far as, as weight. He, um, this is the one he put out today. He takes a cold shoe and he built a cold shoe extension bar. So he has his battery, his Rode microphone, and an LED light all sitting on his hot shoe, which looks like it's going to fall off at any given time. Yeah, uh, we so, use, some for the videos, we use a square, a square thing that has three hot shoe mounts on it. Yeah. So you can do that, a, a light, a microphone, and something else. Right, but you, you're going on center yeah. and, and like this. No, this is like it comes up like half an inch and goes out. And it just, like the bar is bending and it looks like it's going to hurt his camera. It's crazy. He's Aussie, what do you want? <laughs> yep. And then uh, sticking with the Aussies, uh, the researchers at the, uh, what is, I, I got this wrong the first time I read through it. Research the, School of Engineering at Australian National University. Yes. Uh, they are making... Uh, inexpensive droplet lenses, they're calling them. They're, uh, they're basically taking uh, liquid silicone and dropping it onto a sheet and baking it. And they can control the angle of the lens, so therefore the amount of magnification it can get. And they're making very inexpensive and relatively high quality, comparative for how small they are at least, lenses, uh, which their main goal is to get them into small field devices for doing testing in the field. I mean, obviously, something like this wouldn't replace a glass lens in a DSLR or, yeah. or an MILC. But the fact that they can make them, and they're basically disposable lenses in case something happens, you don't have to worry about it. And they're, they're, they're trying to get them into... I mean, it, field microscopes. Field microscopes, basically, yeah. So that's just kind of cool. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. light and optics is... 99% of what we're looking at every day. So I just saw, saw the what's, article and I was like, that's actually kind of cool. What's the other 1% of things you're looking at that aren't made of light? Um, the camera body. This table. <laughs> Still looking at light, Tom. The, my beer. Speaking of dumb Canon people. Uh, <laughs> no, no, this doesn't say that these are just Canon buyers. This is all... What, are people buying Nikon equipment and getting counterfeit Canon equipment? <laughs> <laughs> but no, the, the study was just commissioned in general. It just happens to be that Canon commissioned the study. Of their equipment? Of, of all consumer electronic equipment. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah, counterfeit gear as a whole makes sense. Yeah. I, I read that as counterfeit Canon equipment. No, no, it's, it's counterfeit. Um, so read, read the story. <laughs> <laughs> now that I burst your bubble. Um, Canon uh, committed, uh, commissioned a, a study uh, on people who buy, unknowingly buy counterfeit gear. Uh, any consumer electronic gear is really what they're aiming at. Um, they were curious for their own uses as to you know, how much counterfeit gear is out there and things like that. 
but the, the study was mostly in general, and they say that um, up to 18% of consumers have purchased counterfeit goods without even knowing it. Um, so they surveyed like 1,100 uh, people who bought any kind of electronics in 2013. Canon found that 30% of them bought counterfeit goods. Um, and then these are the specific statistics that they put out in the press release. This is kind of a teaser because the official report isn't completely out yet. 12% uh, of U.S. consumers surveyed knowingly bought fake consumer electronics, while 18% bought it unknowingly. I feel like you have to kind of knowingly purchase a lot of that stuff. It makes sense that some people at least knewing, knew that the crap that they were purchasing from Amazon China was fake. Some of them, yeah. Like, the stuff I know that I have is fake. There's, there's a, I like, there was a speaker or something I bought that I knew. No, it's, Was it Sorny instead no, of Sony? No, no, there was a, it was a video game, um, it was a card for a, D, uh, for a Nintendo DS. All right. Which, when you purchased it, there was like a 90% chance it was counterfeit, but they worked exactly the same and looked exactly the same, so no one cared. Well, it's, like, it's, it's uh, probably fake, but no one cares. Well, if you think about it, you know, there's this whole thing where, you know, SD cards are like fake. Yeah, I can so see So much it. of the time. So. I can see SD cards being fake a lot of times. SD cards are fake so much of the time. It's, it's frightening. Yeah, so I realize that's that. That's why I buy from only places that I trust. Right, so and even I, then, you're not guaranteed. So, so before I read that story, I'm going to go change the games. All right, you can talk about the national forest. No, I was going to I was going to finish this story. Oh, fine, finish your story. Because there's some more stats here. Um, some of the uh, more interesting stats are that 40 percent of U.S. consumers surveyed were unaware that counterfeit consumer electronics may cause them harm. Uh, this is probably because they don't realize that. You know, counterfeit batteries can go boom. Uh, that that was one of the pictures that was in the press release was a counterfeit Canon battery that had exploded. It was kind of a neat picture. Like the ones you use? I don't use counterfeit. I use knowingly use third-party batteries. Which is the same thing with a different label on them? Maybe, but at least I know it's not Canon. <laughs> they didn't pretend like it was a Canon. Exactly. They they I know I have two Canon batteries and two third-party batteries. I, I just have third-party batteries, but I've never had a problem with it. I, neither have I, because I never purchased them. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. 45% uh, of people believe that counterfeit consumer electronics do the job just as well as genuine consumer electronics. Sure they do. You know what the worst thing to buy counterfeit or crappy? Hmm. Those Anchor battery packs. Yeah. That's why you buy Anchor, because it's a known, it's a known company. And the other ones, they like, they'll have five stars, four and a half stars on Amazon, and you read the top five reviews, and it's like, set my house on fire, melted in my drawer, and almost caught my house on fire. Yeah. Burned me a lot. And it's like, shows pictures and stuff. It's like, no, I'm not going to buy that one. Yeah. So never, never just go buy the number of stars on Amazon. No, no. Read the reviews. <laughs> Trust me. There's a great XKCD comment, the comic on that a couple, of, about a year ago. And it's like, this app in the App Store gets 4.5 stars. And it was like, the first... Two reviews were like, great user interface, five stars, works wonderfully. Or no, the alert sounds were great. The app, you read further down, you realize the app is Tornado Warning app. <laughs> and then the, next, like, the next one is like, uh, did not alert me of Tornado, one star. <laughs> <laughs> so star ratings are not everything. Um, let's see, the next bullet point here is that 97% uh, of people wanted more information so they could identify counterfeits. That at least makes me feel a little better that people want to know they're buying counterfeit. It's not that hard to f not buy counterfeit equipment. Yeah, right. yeah. And millennials were surveyed were five times more likely than baby boomers to purchase fake goods. Because we don't have jobs and buy things on the internet. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then 72% of people thought they were knowledgeable in identifying a counterfeit consumer electronic product, but as you can see, you know, one in four, basically, one in five, still end up buying them, so they can't be that good at it. Um, the full report's expected out by the end of the summer, so that'll be an interesting read, and if it's like any other statistical report I've read recently, it's going to put me to sleep. I like the bullet point version of it. Yeah, who reads the whole statistical report of almost anything ever, other than me, now that I say that? <laughs> um, my marketing department at work. They read a lot of that stuff. Yeah, it's and then I tell them, give me the bullet point version. Oh, so you're done with the, the weird fake stuff? Yeah. 
So the, the key takeaway there is buy from reputable places that you know, not like, you know. Amazon, anything on Amazon almost can be counter, can be subject to that. I, I think if you buy from Amazon, not from a third party through Amazon, it's in much more shape. likely that it's fine. Yeah. But even then, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't tend to buy through distributors. But. Well, I mean, I bought my, I, I don't know if it's counterfeit. It read, the serial number reads right, but that one SD card I bought from Staples of all places that just does not hold up to what oh, they yeah. claim. And it's like, I ended up, I use it as a data storage. It's basically a glorified thumb drive now because it's the only thing it's useful for. I can't even put it in the Rebel. It's not fast enough. And that thing can't even, can't even read class 10 cards. So next up, the FAA is looking to levy. Did they, I don't think they actually have yet. They haven't they, yet. They kind of rattled the shields and whatnot about wanting to charge someone else the $10,000 magical mystery fine for operating a drone commercially when they were documenting tor the tornado damage, tornado damage recently in Arkansas. So I saw the video right when it came out. I saw, yep. I watched all of it because it's good, good footage. Um, yeah. But the FAA is threatening to, even though they know they can't really legally now. No, because they've already been shot down um, once. Yeah. <laughs> Levy the $10,000 fines. If you didn't hear about the first, first part about that is they've been all along and have been overturned in levying a $10,000 fine with no actual written law to do so. Yeah. Or previous, you know, books, anything on the books about charging people this. So they, they use a commercial piloting thing, I think. Yeah, what, like, what they did last time, and, and the story you're talking about, we, we talked about on, on here a couple of weeks ago, was there's a guy who was filming a, uh, was the opening shot for like the, the University of West Virginia's uh, new online video for prospective yeah. students. And, these, and he was a uh, Swedish or Norwegian photographer that they brought in to yeah, do this. Totally. And they wanted to charge him for flying a plane without a commercial pilot's license. Yeah, because that makes sense. It's, it's, it's this big. Yeah. And what ended up happening was the courts basically went back to the, the FAA and said, you, you don't have a rule that says you can't fly that. As far as the court was concerned, it's the same as flying a remote-controlled airplane, which has a completely different set of rules, and the FAA can only do anything to you if you were to, say, fly it over an airport. Yeah, I mean, this, this has certain... I get the ramifications of flying it over an active, like, recovery area and, like, actually over an emergency area. I, I get that, but they're, they're not, that's not what they're talking about. They're no. not talking about that at all. And this is, this is a journalist thing, a storm chaser thing. This isn't actually, yeah. like, a commercial it, it, use. Yeah, these are, and, and they said, you know, they, they, there's more than one guy involved. Um, the, the one who, who brought the story to light and the one whose video you saw, uh, Brian uh, M. Finger, uh, he's the one that they're going, they're making the, the example of, but it, yeah, you're right. It's, it was storm yeah. chasers. These guys, if you're going to arrest them for that, arrest them for being dumb enough to drive into a tornado. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were there right afterward too. Yeah. The, the footage is really nice. The footage is, um, yeah. really interesting to watch. And, and then, you know, this comes into that, that argument we've had plenty of times. When is it commercial use? When is it journalistic use? I mean, I, they're going to need to, to rectify that really yeah. quickly. Because yeah, it's easy to see where that's going to interfere with remote flying operations in the future on a governmental basis like that, as a search and search and rescue vehicle is a thing. Yeah. So you can't be interfering with potential search and rescue by doing that as a journalist. Eventually, the sky is going to have to drone things in it. Yeah, but in this case, it's like, hey, he went to go survey, and I think if it wasn't him. It was one of the other guys that that, that was involved in this. Was actually asked by the city or the town that he was in to fly the drone yeah. because they wanted that aerial view. They wanted to be able to no, see what you can see. Could. You can see so clearly into the damaged houses. You can see the yeah. rescue work going through. You can keep track of people with those. Yeah. And it's, you know, it definitely needs to actually be regulated in a way that doesn't just, you know, throw giant flying people in a reason. Well, you know, it's the FAA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. So... But one place you cannot use your quadcopter, hexacopter. I don't know, there's no maybe on this one. Because it's not the FAA that's involved in this one. Um, National Forest Service is betting aerial camera. Oh, okay. So, so the phrase, or other airborne means, yep. means a lot in this a lot. Yes. 
This is actually a law that dates back quite a ways. Which they worded correctly in the first which place. Which they worded correctly <laughs> in the first place. Uh, the National Park Service um, put out a news release reminding people that you can't fly helicopters and thing, you know, and remote control planes and things in national parks. It's it, digging into it, it, it. It's kind of twofold. One is not so that these things make noise and they don't want to scare the animals. And the other thing is these things make noise and it bothers other people at the park. Yeah. So they basically came out and said, look, we know you guys want to get these cool aerial video shots, but you can't just go taking drones into national parks. And it's starting with Yosemite, and it's, it's starting to disseminate the whole system. Because the only people who can legally fly aircraft in a national park is the National Park Service, or someone they designate. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to get expensive. Uh, which also means if it's someone they designate, you could get a permit in theory to go through a million hoops because it's federal. But yeah. But, you know, if, if BBC wanted to come in and do another part of planet Earth and they wanted to fly and roll up, they used there. actual planes for that. It's like, that wasn't even, like, little things. That was yeah. big friggin' Cessna. But, you know, they, they at least wrote, wrote the law right the first time, and it's been around forever. It's 36 CFR is an old, old statute. Um, so, it, it, Basically, it's common sense. If you're going to piss people off, they're going to call the park ranger. Yeah, it's, so it's like a, the drones of all shapes and sizes. Yeah. So, it, 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 don't, don't fly them in national parks. What about state parks? State parks would be a state issue, not a federal. So you, you I just want one. It's one of those things I'm never going to have the money to purchase. Really, realistically, I'm not going to spend $1,500 on a camera kit for that. Yeah. But, damn, that'd be fun. We could launch off the roof. We could. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Get drone day. Oh, be before we get off of drones, because I saw this after I printed these out for us. Um, some guy in... I don't know what the word was, because I didn't write it down. There was a guy who built a custom drone. Six, it was a uh, hexacopter, so it had six blades. And he was using it to smuggle contraband into a prison. That's badass. Yeah. I, I was like... Holy crap. How does that get shot out of the sky, though? Apparently, it was coming in part of the, I at guess, night. they were doing it at night, and I guess part of the idea of using the six was that it didn't have to spin as fast, so it was quieter. <laughs> but yeah, this guy was, like, smuggling contraband into prisons by flying oh, his homemade great. drone, not even, like, something he bought. Like, they showed pictures well, yeah. of it. It was totally, like, a homemade rig. They, like, flew it in and landed it, and then the clamp released, and then he would fly it out the way. It's like, it's freaking crazy. Oh, I remember where I saw it. It was on the um, it was in a, it was in a shadow room uh, post in uh, on Facebook. Oh, yeah. So they were like, "The future no, is no. now." No, you motherfucker! What? They turn off. Is there like a two gig card in this? Gonna punch me in the face. Yeah, there is a two gig card in that. It's <laughs> full. Well, let's see how far back. Smash. Hi. Hello. All right. I'll make sure you hit it again so it actually records. Hey! Hey! Motherfuckers. Alright, so moral of the story is, two gig memory cards, unless you're Ken Rockwell, not a good idea. Oh, God. <laughs> Note to self, kill video guy. Oh, wait, that's me. Kill audio guy. Still you. No, that's Jesse. It's his audio gear. You're the one who fucking said whatever. It, it was recording. I was I supposed to know we were gonna fill two gigs? Pen's dead too. <laughs> <laughs> I give up. I give up. <laughs> so next story, asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> so last week we, we we were talking about the introduction of the Lytro Lytro Ilum. And I was thinking about this during the week, and I was like, I actually came up with a couple of ideas of what it might actually be useful for. All right, shoot. I was thinking, shooting concerts. Why, so you can zoom in on the back of people's heads? No, I mean, if you could get in the pit, you'd be able to take one shot, and then if you needed to get the... You could just all be in focus. If you are not dead center on the stage, shooting a concert, it's really hard to get the whole band in focus because the drummer's in the back. 
Yeah. Your bass player, you might have a bass and guitar right in front of you, but you know, rhythm guitar will be pretty far away from you. You can't really get all of them on the same plane very easily. Yeah. So you'd have to go to like a really high f-stop in order to get enough depth of field to get them all in focus. Yeah. I, and it's poorly lit to start with. The pictures are less useful. Like, what are you gonna put it on a const on a band's website? Yeah. It's the thing is you need a web app lit for this, so it's it yeah. severely limits your application. Oh yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. So that that was one of my ideas. I mean, it's just war gaming. You realize no one does that, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's not even a thing. That's not even a thing. I know. Like we do that, and that's not even a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, my other my other one was for what sport? I was thinking football in particular. What are you gonna like? Just take center? Well, well, well yeah. But you know, when you look at, well, I don't know how much football you actually watch, but they have the uh, multi camera angles now where they can like spin it around. Yeah. I was like, well, you can solve all that. Just use one nitro. It doesn't do that. Well, no, you don't get the full. It's the opposite spin. of that. It stays in one place and focuses. Right, but they already have the thing that moves and turns on the gimbal that they fly over the stadium. So but you could put it where like, you need it. Those already keep everything in focus as it is. Right, but they can still only focus on one thing at a time. The whole they focus the whole field with those. Those aren't those are not slow. Those are not small f stop cameras. I mean large f stop cameras, you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Those are Big broadcast cameras that can keep. Okay, I'm in trying focus. to help these guys out and come up with something they can do. No, there's plenty of like Lytro stuff. Like I see wedding use, I see event use as a general. Kids stuff is kind of interesting. Even family portrait stuff is kind of funny. Concerts maybe, but sports doesn't really make any sense. Okay, I was just trying to come up with ideas. I, I mean, like I a baseball team pose shot would be kind of fun. But again, it's. I I mean I do see that being an interesting trope to do selective focus, well, stuff like that. Well, I was also thinking, if you were doing, when you're talking baseball, you could be behind home plate, take the picture, and then you could actually focus on all of the different positions in the field with one shot. Yeah, it doesn't really have the magnification power to zoom in on. Well, no, you're not, okay, you're not gonna get the guys in the outfield, but you yeah. could get the whole infield. Maybe. They'd be kind of small in the center, which is kind of weird. Like you're gonna you're gonna zoom in on that guy and you're just gonna focus to that guy, but it's already kind of infinite anyway. It's it's you, I, you I like what? the idea. I like that they they just kind of skipped step two and went to just a big camera that I actually might use at once in my life. But there's there's a lot of limiting factors for it actually making money. Yeah, I kind of feel like Lytro went the way of the underwear gnomes. Step one: build awesome fucking camera with brand new concept that no one's ever seen. Step three: profit. I mean, for them, it's interesting. I, and I think the price point, even at like a thousand dollars, whatever it was, twelve hundred dollars, uh, sixteen with the lens. Uh, it's interchangeable lens. Yeah. Okay. It's just they only have the one lens so far for it. But I didn't realize that it was interchangeable lens. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna make the new, the Ilum's gonna have interchangeable lenses. Oh, that's interesting. That that thirty was it? Like a thirty two hundred. Um, and then they're gonna they they planned on. They announced they're going to, it is interchangeable, they just don't have any other lenses yet. Well, I so you're going to you're get a telephoto at some point. That's cool. I mean, I, that, again, expands And probably years. a super wide at some point as well. Yeah, super wide would be weird. It's better in telephoto. Yeah. It works but, better in telephoto. You know what? You put it out there, people will find a use for it. I, I could find a use for it. It's just kind of an expensive piece of equipment to find a use for. Like yeah. It's not a cheap lens baby or something. It's Well, that's why I mean, someone will find a use for it. And then once it gets a little, you know, the creativity gets out there and some people get to actually, you know, some people who have the disposable income or get, you know, I, I would say commissioned or get, you know, asked to play with it, maybe, you know, Lytro will be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see shooting one and I could have a lot of fun doing it. I just don't see putting out the cash for it right away. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things I would love to demo it because it's... Yeah, exactly. I could see definitely doing event stuff with that. I could see selling it for event stuff. Um, well, I, can, I mean, there's a thousand ways to use that at an event. Oh, yeah. It's, it's to the consumer end that's interesting that you need to know. It's how to deliver that yeah. ability, which is difficult. I, you know what? The, the biggest thing they could do once it gets out in the field and, and people are using it 
would be to either A, make it so it integrates directly into HTML5 so it can just be used anywhere. I thought it already was. Or maybe it Might is. Be. I thought you needed an app for it, a server-side app for it. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Or B, partner with somebody in social media like a Facebook or, a, well, I guess Facebook, or Google if they want to try and really make Google Plus for... Wish they're not. But uh, And make it so that you can upload those files there and it just works for, those, for people using those services. You would need a Facebook applet to work. That's that's an interesting thing. Is you need like there are ways to make Facebook applet stuff work like that, right? Um, but yeah. like video now works just natively in Facebook. You don't need a. I, if if it becomes the standard, it could be very interesting, and I see that they want that to happen, and I, I, it might. I, it's it's very cool. It just it takes a lot for that to happen. I think there's a lot of infrastructure that has to get built for it. But yeah, although the gallery on the, have you gone and looked at the gallery? Yeah, the Lego uh, DeLorean set that they built on it is pretty awesome. Oh, I didn't actually see the yeah, Lego. You see the Lego DeLorean? They, they built a, they rebuilt the scene from the end of Back to the Future 2 where Doc is, gets zapped away by the lightning strike. Uh, they, somebody built that in Legos, and then they, they put the Lytro to it and took the picture of it. So you can focus in on the Michael J. Fox Lego guy, you can focus in on the Doc Brown Lego guy, you can focus in on the DeLorean, and, and they really took advantage of the fact that it can spin a little bit, like that five degree tilt that you have. So like you can never look at the whole picture at once the way you want to. It's, yeah, it's which is cool. kind of the whole point. Yeah. It's silly that the whole point of that thing is to selective focus at all times and yeah. not to have everything in focus. Because it can do that too. It could. It could just as easily put everything in focus in the camera and oh, yeah. give you a picture. So it, I don't know, it looks like it's going to be fun, but. Yeah. No, it could be interesting. All right, so my ideas are crap and We'll just never bring Pretty those much, in. yeah. That, that, that's what happens. Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to play with one. Yeah. Have they, are they out, out? Uh, no, because you can still pre-order them. I'd be curious once they actually hit the field once people, what people start doing with them and if it really that, lives up to that. That's what, I, that's what I want to see is when they get out there. What I really want, I don't know if anyone at our favorite camera store is is watching, but you guys should get a demo into the Providence store. Wink, wink. Yeah, it's... Then we can play with it and see what the hell it does and maybe buy one. Who am I kidding? Maybe. I'll probably just end up buying one. I could use it. It's one of those things I, I know I would use it, but is it actually that... Is it worth it? That interesting. I think it's interesting. I just don't know how interesting other people will think it is. If, uh, if I felt like other people would think it was that interesting, then I would. It's, yeah. it's gimmicky enough that it would, might actually work. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is, I, I, when I was playing in the gallery, I was almost imagining, um, like, this is how you get images for a holodeck. Like the Star Trek holodeck. Yeah, it's still two-dimensional, but yeah. But because you have the selective focusing, you could get more, you get more data. I don't know, I was just like... Yeah, it is. I mean, I was it's, like, this is, it's, the, it's the first step. You could step build a front map. Yeah. You, you, it's the first step. Everything in baby steps. Is that a hall imager? Well, or whatever made up thing they talked about? We could make holograms. I saw one at the airport. <laughs> I mean, you walk right through it, but I saw one at the airport. In, where the hell did I go? Richmond. When I, was in, when I went through Richmond, there was a hologram at the airport reading me all my rules for, as I was yeah. going through TSA. <laughs> Because, you know, I like the one in Providence. It's just the voiceover. You don't, this was kind of a creepy hologram. Yeah, that's not creepy at all, right? <laughs> You're not in a future dystopia, no. <laughs> Ignore the hologram reading of your rights. <laughs> I'm reading 1984 right now. Uh, I did, so. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. I'm it's totally not. Yeah. I, I finished Neuromancer, and I'm, finished, I'm, I'm rereading that series now. So. I started reading because I lost my tablet, but then I just found it, so I'm probably just going to stop reading. <laughs> See, I read on my tablet. I read in my, my paper white, well, my paper screen Kindle, which I really like. It requires a book light, which feels so old, but. <laughs> That's why I read on my Kindle Fire, no, which doesn't I require a backlight. I can go to sleep afterwards. <laughs> you can't go to sleep, you have to use an LCD screen all day. But yeah. That should be interesting. I mean, 
it's it's integration to 3D at some point would be interesting. Mm. Yeah, that that's that's because wouldn't it? They'd be able to make a set that would be 3D natively. Yeah. But that's not going to happen anyway because nobody cares about 3D and personal devices. They tried. That kind of failed. Yeah, but if we can get to a point where we can do 3D without. They did. Some lenticular 3D is, was mm. thing. It was in phones. And nobody bought them. <laughs> My boss has one that takes 3D video and takes 3D video, 3D video and pictures and displays them kind of in a cool way. And nobody cares. We can put this in 3D. <sighs> YouTube gives me that option to, to make a. You know how hard it is to take 3D DSLR footage? You know how hard it is just to make DSLR footage work right now? DSLR footage is not that hard. <laughs> Yep. So that's all my yeah. I can't really think about anything else. News crap. Um, well, no. One one more news thing. It's not really news. It's more of a oh yeah. Uh, Mark Wallace, awesome photographer out of uh, Phoenix. Well, he's out of nowhere now because he has started his worldwide journey. Uh, and I'm gonna keep track of it because it, it's gonna be fun. He's in the Bahamas to start with. I, I might even keep things up to date on here and. Maybe if I, I do that enough, and uh, maybe one of these days we'll actually be able to get him to like Skype in or something, and be like, "Hey, I'm in X place here." And no, probably not. No, he's a really nice guy. I, I'm though. sure he is. He really is. Um, so uh, his blog on um, the trip around the world is uh, spontaneousworld.com. Uh, obviously, he's a photographer. He's traveling with uh, Alexis Catherine. She's a model. And they are going to have some serious fun traveling the world. And uh, the posts they put up even before they left of things like backpack Jenga. I was like, oh. I imagine like taking a backpacking trip and having to live for like a week out of it, and that's a pain in the ass to pack. They're going for two years plus. They don't even have an end date in mind. So yeah, I, I was like, what the hell? No shit. That be interesting. So that, that'll be a fun journey to follow. And, and I, I did kind of, you know, he put his first post up from the Bahamas, like, at, you know, shortly after they landed. And he's like, highlights of day one. Yeah, almost died. I almost twice. drowned. Got hit by a car, got our shit stolen. Like, yeah. It's like, wow. You guys, it's going to be a fun trip. Yeah. So. Stepped on a sea urchin. Yep. It was a shitty 24 hours. But things seem to be better now. I mean, I, I've. It's I, also the Bahamas, so they can shut the fucking mouth. Yeah, it's like you're getting paid to go to the F-Stoppers conference in the Bahamas. That mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll. I mean, those things suck. But really, you're in the Bahamas getting paid for a conference, and you, when you're in India, and that happens. Those to you, things. Yeah. I mean, the F-Stoppers thing doesn't suck. No, it's not. It's fun. It's people paying a lot of money to go have fun. I I would totally go to an F-Stoppers event if they didn't charge ridiculous amounts of money to go. I'd totally go to a lot of things if they didn't charge a ridiculous amount of money to go. That's true. That's that's a blanket statement. I'm going to Terracon. I don't have to pay for that. I have to work. I went to DoubleCon. I don't have to pay for that. You had to work. Much. <laughs> you only paid with your soul. Yeah. <laughs> I went to TempleCon too. That's why there's a sticker on the corner of the desk there. There's a meeting tomorrow. There's a meeting tomorrow. Although by the time this airs, the meeting will Last have been yesterday. <laughs> I'm hoping to get this up for Friday, but that'd no. be nice. Probably not, since I have to go to the meeting tomorrow. Nope. We'll be up Saturday, or just yeah, whatever. No, I don't want to wait too long on these for more. It's not to wait too long. Just no, I just the fact that I want to go out, out. All right, all right. So that, that's all we've got this week. Uh, we, we we did get a couple of we did get some good feedback on previous episodes and uh, our. Our video on the uh, crash course in the exposure triangle is up. It's up. We've got some views on it. We've got some good feedback from it. Uh, I think that's going to be, it's an eight-minute video. Uh, eight minutes and one second with the, uh, with the end credits. And I think that... <laughs> the end credits of us three people. <laughs> five people. There were five of us in that the one. end credits of us, us, of us five people. Um, and we have to give credit for the music and things like that. Um, but... <clears throat> I think that's going to be the new short format, as I want to do. I've, I've yeah, got eight, ten minutes. Eight to ten minutes, uh, and we're going to pick 
some you know little segments to kind of spend eight ten minutes talking about. Uh, the next one I have written down is actually expanding on aperture and how it affects depth of field and light. So that's going to be the next video, and we've got a couple more planned after that. Uh, if you have any questions, anything you want us to explain, make sure you post them up in the comments, send us an email. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Always subscribe to the channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Okay, I hope that's enough subliminal messaging that you hit the subscribe button. Um, and I'm looking forward to making more of those videos because I didn't even tell my parents I put those up. Of course, I blast the Bucket Castle photo stuff everywhere, so it's really not a surprise they saw it. And they even thought it was pretty good. And I mean, that this is my dad. You know, you'd think it'd be like, oh, well, it's your parents. They're going to be nice to you. My dad's one of my toughest critics. So when I put crap out there, he's like, that's crap. He'll call me out on it. So I, was, I felt pretty good about that. Yeah. And that no, should be fun. And The Hobbit likes our podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. Our, our friend Matt from Warwick, uh, he actually lived, this kills me, he lives in Warwick, he goes to Johnston to come back to Providence to do the other podcast. Oh, yeah. That, that seems silly that, to me. Yeah, that's silly. But uh, he, he, he works at a coffee shop. I stopped in to get coffee over the weekend, and he was like, dude, I love your podcast. I was like, sweet. Good I'll time. have a dark roast, extra cream, extra sugar. Yeah, sweet. Can I get that, that extra cream thing? Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. So it should be interesting. Well, it, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'll come up with some more fun shit to do. Oh yeah, and, and I checked right before we uh, right before we started recording. We were up to over 200 views. We have eight subscribers. All eight subscribers. All eight Beautiful. of them. So all eight of you. Thank you. Seven, six, five, four. four. That weren't in the videos. <laughs> all right. I I. Honestly, no, like, I get the little fine. emails. From, I get the little emails from YouTube that say new people have subscribed. And it gives me the list of the user names, and I'm like, it doesn't tell me anything about them, but some of them I can figure out, okay, I know who that is, I know who that is. Some of them either they have really good user names, I don't know who they are, or they're just people who are seeing yeah, it. it. could be just random people, but that's what we want. We want random people. Yeah, cool. Looking forward to random stuff. And we're going to do random stuff, and now that the weather's getting better, we're going to uh, get outside a bit more, do some other stuff, and uh, maybe even uh, I'll challenge you to some contests here and there. Oh, yeah. We're going to do that. Sure. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. All right. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Why is there a two gig card in this? Why two? You couldn't put like a six or an eight or a fourteen like